All right, well, um, thank you everyone for, for coming today. Um, really delighted uh, to be holding this discussion on, a, uh, I think, a self-evidently important topic. And this is a great reason to be, um, to be discussing this. We're here, obviously, to um, highlight, promote, discuss uh, this, this great new book, uh, which just came out on Tuesday, I believe. Uh, the, the third was the official launch date. Um, and this is about a topic which is incredibly relevant, important, but as the authors discuss, uh, understudied um, and, and underemphasized. So uh, I don't want to waste too much time here with a big, long intro. Uh, I will only have an intro so I can highlight the work of uh, uh, um, Aruna next to me, who has been doing really fantastic uh, reporting for the Wall Street Journal on the same topic, and I'm going to quote from uh, one of her stories from April of this year, because it sets us up nicely, um, where uh, in, a, in a piece co-authored with her colleague Dustin Voltz, she, the first sentence says, Chinese spies are increasingly recruiting U.S. intelligence officers as part of a widening, sustained campaign to shake loose government secrets. Uh, current and former U.S. officials say China has also grown bolder and more successful in traditional spy games, including targeting less conventional recruits. And she quotes the now infamous statement uh, by uh, Christopher Wray at the FBI that no country poses a broader, more severe intelligence collection threat than China. They're doing it through Chinese intelligence services, through state-owned enterprises, through ostensibly private companies, through graduate students and researchers, through a variety of actors all working on behalf of China. And finally, and this is one of my favorite quotes from the piece by Rob Joyce, he says, Russia is the hurricane. It comes in fast and hard. China is climate change, long, slow, pervasive. Um, I hope and I suspect that uh, all of the three people on this stage here will have disagreements both on some of these statements um, between each other about this issue of Chinese espionage, about what we think we know about uh, uh, organs like the Ministry of State Security, the MSS, what some of the myths are that we uh, th that we believe that, it, that aren't true. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the two authors, uh, Peter Mattis and, and Matt Brazil. What we're going to do is we're going to turn it to them for 20, 25 minutes. They're going to walk us through uh, the book, main findings, how it was organized, uh, how this beautiful partnership uh, came about. Uh, and then I will uh, moderate a discussion here uh, with all three of them on, on these issues, and then we'll save some time for Q&A. I will plant the seed now that the Q&A period is primarily, uh, if not solely, about actual questions. So as you're thinking of uh, the long, discursive comment you want to make, I'd ask that you email it to us instead of using precious time here. We really want to we want to hear everyone's questions so we can hear about them. Uh, so be thinking of, uh, of tight, tight questions to ask when we get to the Q&A period. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to uh, Matt and Peter. All right. Well, first, thank you very much, Jude and NCSIS, for, for hosting us today. And thank you also to, to Glenn Howard and the Jamestown Foundation, as well as Glenn Griffith and the Naval Institute Press for, for believing in the project and, and carrying it forward. Um, a, a quick disclaimer, since I am in a, in a government position, I am, I am speaking here solely in a personal capacity. Um, I've taken leave to be here. Um, I'm off the clock. So my views are, are my own and do not represent the Congressional Executive Commission on China, its staff, or any of its members. So if you're going to quote what I say, I hope you'll at least acknowledge that this is being said in a personal capacity and does not represent any of the, of the people with whom I'm either work for or am associated. Um, I, I hate to sort of downplay expectations for the book. It's not a, it's not a gripping spy thriller, um, and that's that's by intent. It, it is meant to be a bit of a, a bit of a reference guide and a, a primer, an introduction. Um, and we were we made a number of choices that I think were rather conservative in what we what we chose to include and the standards by which we why we chose cases or the or the entries. Um, in part because there's a real need I think to demystify Chinese intelligence and not say oh there's this you know 5,000 year history or 3,000 years depending how you want to count it you know, this, that invoking Sunza as a sort of mystical um, embodiment of, of intelligence operations. But 
let's start from the things that we, we can see and that we know and, and sort of build, from, build outward from there. This is a, this is a starting point, not, not the final answer. And in that respect, we tried to sort of sketch out in our introductory essay sort of what, what took place in the development of Chinese communist intelligence from its origins inside the party in the 1920s to sort of where we are, where we are today and why the Chinese intelligence services and, and methods sort of look the way they do. For the need to demystify, I think there's no further way, no better place to start than the idea that's been kicking around for a very long time about a grains of sand approach to intelligence. You know, sometimes called a mosaic approach or, or any of a host of kind of tentacle-like metaphors for describing what, what the Chinese government is doing or what the intelligence services are doing. And it got passed around by a little anecdote saying that, you know, if the grains of sand on a beach are, in, you know, the information products that you want, want to gather, the Russians would have a submarine surface in the middle of the night, a Spetsnaz team would come ashore, they'd pick up a few buckets of sand, they'd go back to the submarine and be gone by dawn. The United States would, you know, park a satellite in geosynchronous orbit, pick up all sorts of signals, maybe throw in some massive sensors along the approaches to the beach, and then, you know, go from there. The Chinese, on the other hand, would send a thousand bathers, and when they left, they'd shake out their towels and their beach baskets, and in the end, China would know more about it than anyone else. There's a slight problem with that, with that analogy. Most notably, that national security information isn't a public beach, right? You, you don't get to send a thousand bathers. Um, you can't even get a thousand Americans onto the onto that public beach or onto that beach in a very easy way because of the security clearance process. So, but this view, because it has a nice catchy little story, sort of gained purchase and gathered around, and it, it had a few problems with it. You know, the first was that they said that the Chinese intelligence services basically did not use tradecraft. You know, they didn't, they didn't use traditional methods of recruiting sources or handling sources or um, you know, maintaining the relationship between case officers and agents and the passage of information through you know, covert communications, through dead drops, and, and other things. Now, there, there are certainly distinct differences in styles, but that's not really true, and it never has been. Um, the second was that amateurs formed the core of what Chinese intelligence did. And I think Matt's going to speak a little bit to this, but in a lot of these cases, and if you go through, if you go through the book and you look at sort of the hard, the hard espionage cases, you don't see, you don't see amateurs leading the way um, when the intelligence services are there. The third point that I think is important about this is that it conflated basically any Chinese entity with being Chinese intelligence. So when people said Chinese intelligence acting in this way, Chinese intelligence meant something very, very different than what it means when we say Russian intelligence or U.S. intelligence. And the rough equivalent would be saying, if we, you know, when we say U.S. intelligence, we tend to mean the U.S. intelligence community specifically, or maybe even a handful of sort of core agencies within that intelligence community. But when people were using Chinese intelligence, they were pretty much saying any Chinese person connected to the PRC who does anything that looks like collecting information or technology or, or, or influence. That's a pretty broad definition, and it certainly isn't a cognate when we, if we were to say, you know, U.S. intelligence and start saying, oh, actually, we include Boeing and J.P. Morgan and every hedge fund and anything that an American does abroad, um, including our friends at the Wall Street Journal, um, you know, they must be intelligence because that's how we're doing it. You know, the system is, is set up differently, but that's the wrong way to do it. And again, that speaks to why we chose kind of a conservative approach about what we, what we included. The other, the other downside of this is that it, it creates the notion of every Chinese person as a potential spy. And whatever you think of that proposition, um, that's not really a, it's not a practically useful way for assessing risk. It doesn't help you understand what parts of the system are doing what things. Um, and, you know, it has a notable feature of, you know, not really being true. Um, to say that the Chinese intelligence services have had more success recruiting Chinese people or ethnic Chinese nationals abroad, you know, that part you can, you can see, but to say that that's been solely the focus or that that's where they were really putting all of their effort, I don't think accurately captures, accurately captures the history. 
So I'll just sort of sum that, sum that up with saying, you know, the Chinese intelligence services have always had tradecraft. You know, we, the Bernard Bursico case, for example, um, the Larry Wu Tai Chin case, is a, it, these are great classic cases that are, that are detailed. There's a case officer agent relationship, there are third country meeting points, there are third country places for dropping off, dropping off data, um, for a courier to pick up, there are people going to borders and getting whisked across and not having stamps in their passport so they can go, go have meetings. This is traditional and classic tradecraft, and the Larry Wu Tai Chin case runs from sometime in the late 1940s to 1985. So that encompasses a pretty long history of, of Chinese intelligence. I'd also make the point that for years, what we've seen from, from the Chinese intelligence services is that the scope, scale, and potential impact you know, because of China's role in the world, um, because of the security situation in East Asia, because of the future of Taiwan, because of a whole variety of, of things. It's that scope, scale, and potential impact of Chinese intelligence operations that was a real, that was a real threat. Um, and it wasn't necessarily the operational sophistication. That, however, is changing. And I think you, know, you could look at the periods that's covered in, covered in the book and see you know, a fairly sophisticated sort of revolutionary period of intelligence. Um, the middle years of, of the PRC not necessarily being all that great. And more recently, an emerging sophistication that is on par with a world-class intelligence service. And I'd attribute that to two, to two things. The first is that when the Ministry of State Security was created in 1983, it basically was a bunch of survivors from purges, or rather a handful of survivors of the three purges of Chinese intelligence, and a lot of police officers who were told one day that you now work for an intelligence service. Uh, not exactly the best way to train people or uh, to give them a lot of skills. So again, should we really be surprised that people who aren't trained for foreign intelligence have better luck with people who they can communicate with directly and more readily um, and have sort of shared sort of cultural references and things. I don't, I don't think it's particularly surprising. But beginning in the 1990s, and I think Matt and I were fairly significant beneficiaries of this, the Ministry of State Security and the PLA actually started some major publication projects to talk about the revolutionary history of Chinese intelligence and to sort of bring out the literature and say, look, this is what we did. And in one of the biographies that we cited of Li Kunong, uh, the author talks about a meeting that they had in the early 1990s with the Minister of State Security, who said, look, you need to write this book because our people don't know their history. They don't know what they're a part of. And we need, you know, we need to build that esprit de corps of the service so that we understand that they're joining sort of a long and glorious <coughs> tradition and you know, that there's some alan associated with, with being a Ministry of State Security professional. And the foreword to that book is written by the Ministry of State Security's general office, and it explicitly says, this book is, is for you to study and to sort of see the history of, of Li Kunong, in this case, and you know, what are the lessons for you in the modern era of, and for the practice of intelligence. The other thing that the Ministry of State Security did is, the, um, is essentially instituting a new training program. They realized that if you were relying on college graduates who had majored in languages or in computer science, you didn't necessarily have the professional skill set that you would hope that they would have when they graduated. And there seems to have been an effort begun sometime in the late 1990s or early 2000s in different parts of the MSS to start recruiting people earlier and younger to say, look, if you're interested in this career, here are the things that you should do. Here's the way you should study languages. Here's the assistance we can offer so that they spent their time in school much more productively in a more focused way to bring those skills into the service. And I've heard some sort of reports that haven't, I can't entirely confirm about creating different kind of internship programs so that young officers would get time in companies so that if they were passing themselves off as, as professional business people, that they would actually look and talk and sound like a professional business person. Unfortunately, you know, as some of the pitches that are discussed in I think chapter six illustrate, you know, business people don't have sort of private meetings in their hotel rooms. You know, they do it in the lounge or in the bar. <laughs> um, 
So not entirely successful, but it is, you know, for those of you who have bumped in to a younger generation of Ministry of State Security Officer, there is a much greater degree of sophistication, more language skills, and ability to interact that was not there 20 year, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and certainly not 30 years ago. The other reason I would say that there's been a, a big change in the sophistication, particularly for the Ministry of State Security, but also to some extent for the PLA, they saw, they saw the sort of movement into cyberspace and the, and the storage of digitization of data and its storage as a real opportunity. And I'd like to, I'd call this a dreadnought moment in signals intelligence and close in technical operations. Because previously, if you wanted to pick up signals, you had to have an industrial like infrastructure. You had to have, you had to have satellites, you had to have dishes, you had to have a global network, you had to have computing power to do decryption because it had gone long you know, encryption had gone long beyond what a human being could, could readily uncover. And that was, a, that was a huge capacity from which China was largely cut off for most of the, for most of the PRC's existence. And it was only in the, in the late 70s and early 80s that it started to get sort of access to some of this, but it was still you know, you know, fairly far behind. But what this, what this offered, and I think the PLA wrote about it well, and the MSS actually did it well, was to see this opportunity and to, and to invest in creating sort of a public and private infrastructure centered around um, a handful of sort of MSS bureaus in particular that created an ecosystem for both the defense and the offense. And therefore you had interchange, you had contractors, you had you had the benefits of the private sector with the, the ability to keep people focused and on target in government. And I think this is one of the reasons why, while well, everyone was yelling about the PLA and sort of appearing in the sort of mid to late 2000s, you know, breaking into places and running off with a lot of data, no one had actually figured out when the, where the Ministry of State Security was. And that attribution came much later, largely because they were, they were much more successful than than most of the PLA was. And this, this movement, I think, is important also for sort of close-in technical operations. You know, the idea of getting a bug inside some place. You had to get it in. You had to find a, a way to, to capture communications. You had to find a way to exfiltrate the data. You know, a, it's a complicated process. And it meant that, you know, for the bug that was discovered inside the U.S. State Department in 1999, you actually had to be able to take a photograph of the wooden sideboard in the conference room. You had to know the quality of your picture to recognize the wood grain and the true color of it so that when you recreated it for when you came back in, that you actually had it accurately captured. You had to have the skills to create the batteries to fit in that kind of constrained space. You had to have a microphone. You had to have a, um, an exfiltration plan for getting that data out. And to, say, and to try to save your batteries so that they weren't just running and using up your energy while it was in the building. And in this big shift is, in a sense, the artisanship and craftsmanship that went into those devices was a skill set that, that a handful of countries really had to do well. The Chinese didn't necessarily have those same experiences, in large part because when they did it domestically, they controlled the environment. And for many years, they had outlawed technical surveillance countermeasures. So those were only in the, in the hands of the government, not in, not in the hands of, of anyone else. So the, but when you look at what it looks like today, you know, using code, the artisanship is in, is, in the, is in the software code, not in the delivery device for that. You know, it's a USB drive. It's, you know, yes, you can come up with ways to hide it, and there's some skill and art in that, but it is a very different set of skills, and it's much easier to teach where we are now today than where we were before this, this dreadnought moment, if you will, in signals intelligence. And last, my last point before turning it over to Matt, I think is that it, it's very important to understand the institutions that are involved. You, you know, intelligence officers for the Ministry of State Security, for the PLA, they're part of large bureaucracies, right? And bureaucracies work in particular way, ways, they reward particular behaviors, um, and, you know, they may or may not have, um, you know, they may or may not be as centralized as we, as we tend to think. The Ministry of State Security, for example, and if you've been reading some of the cases in the book, you see 
some, some trade craft that is quite effective and quite useful, and you also see some boneheaded things that you wonder, like, well, why would we take the Ministry of State Security seriously? And the, you know, one of the answers, and why it's important to understand the institution, is that the Ministry of State Security itself is a central ministry, 31 provincial units, and dozens and dozens of local state security bureaus. All of these organizations hire on their own. So should we really be surprised that the Shanghai State Security Bureau hiring the graduates of Shanghai universities looks slightly different than, say, the Anhui State Security Department? Um, should we really be surprised that given the sort of the breadth and variety of what's in place in China that, that an organization that is this diverse would look, sort of look all over the map? And you, it, it brings up an important point where you can't just say that, oh, there's sophistication here and there's not sophistication here and use that to judge what the service is. Um, but you wouldn't get to this point if you didn't sort of understand that organizational makeup, understand a bit of that history of how people came up and may have been police officers first and then intelligence officers and that we're really back, getting back to a generation of people that have been intelligence officers first rather than, rather than something else. Well, thank you very much. And I also would like to thank the Jamestown Foundation and the people who sponsored us to complete this work, <clears throat> which, um, uh, where we felt sometimes like we were hacking our way through the jungle, but uh, here we are. So I won't say that I'm going to take you through a tour of the history. I'm going to take you through a tour of the violent and exciting past that led to today. <clears throat> so 1927, the year that the Chinese uh, uh, Communist Party and the Kuomintang split, um, was the year of intelligence failures for the Chinese Communist Party because they had virtually nothing in place. They had assassins, and they had VIP protection people, and they had a few spies here and there, but they didn't really have a structure. And so the nationalist coup d'etat of April of that year came as a complete surprise. And indeed, um, at the end of the year, uh, in uh, December, the Canton Uprising, um, Mao Zedong called that, uh, and he didn't say intelligence failure, but he said we failed because we knew virtually nothing about the enemy. And so it was in this context the C CCP founded its first professional organization. And uh, it got off to a rocky start. It was hard to recruit agents at first, but then they recruited their first um, uh, concrete, useful spy ring um, which is referred to today as the Three Heroes of the Dragon's Lair. Uh, Lee Kanong was mentioned earlier. Uh, he was, uh, out of those three people, including Lee as the ringleader, um, he's the one who survived more than a few years, and indeed he went on to lead CCP intelligence in the early years of the People's Republic. So the resulting structure that, that followed with um, intelligence people, um, knuckle-draggers, of course, everybody needs knuckle-draggers, um, analysts, and people who do communications and technical work, that resulting structure um, basically survives into the present. And it's, of course, changed a great deal, um, but the special services section that was founded at that time um, had successes that uh, saved a lot of lives of communist operatives uh, however, when their boss defected over to the Nationalists in 1931, uh, that was a disaster. His name was Gu Xunzhang, and to this day, like one of my distant relatives who's a black sheep in the family, you can't find a picture of him. <laughs> so in 1935, by that time, although it's been depicted as a time of, of uh, brilliant operations uh, by clever individuals, uh, Actually, there was a slow uh, rolling disaster for the Chinese communists as the nationalists cleared their people out of the cities. And in 1935, the uh, special services section was abolished. And this is about the time that Mao Zedong started to have concrete, uh, strong influence over intelligence operations. And his focus was enemies within. Uh, if you've studied China, you've probably heard of the Futian incident in 1931-32 when he purged a great deal of the Red Army of everybody who was opposed to him. 
And this was one of the first, what the Chinese today call the first of three left deviations. They don't say that these were all driven by Mao Zedong himself, but they were. Uh, those, those other three left deviations that are acknowledged today are um, the um, uh, uh, Changzhou or uh, Salvation Campaign in Yan'an in 1943, um, and of course the Cultural Revolution. And in between those, in 1955, there was a gigantic purge of intelligence people when Mao Zedong decided that one of his uh, chief spies from the revolution named Pan Hanyan was actually a traitor because he hadn't reported a meeting uh, with, a, with a, uh, an agent, a, a big agent. Now that left a legacy of purges to solve problems, and of course we see that today. Even though Deng Xiaoping declared that the age of political campaigns is over with when, when he ascended to become China's uh, paramount leader, uh, today of course we see an anti-corruption campaign that's being used to purge the enemies of Xi Jinping. Um, and has uh, left many others intact. But the point is that uh, uh, these purges of corrupt individuals that are going on now have also taken in intelligence people. And indeed, these different purges that I just mentioned each have cleaned out the ranks of Chinese communist intelligence um, and had uh, uh, very severe temporary effects. Um, now, part of that legacy, too, that we see today is that uh, areas during the revolution that were under control of Chinese communists and in the People's Republic. Uh, it was a toxic environment for enemy spies, for people who wanted to come in and spy um, on the, the current government. And uh, uh, this was a continual um, uh, drive, and it was, it was uh, uh, nearly impossible to penetrate eastern China during the uh, uh, the beginning of the, of the PRC regime. Um, a notable exception was the ambush on 25 October 1961 in Tibet of an army column by US sponsored guerrillas that resulted in the capture of eight, 1,600 pages of classified information which you can find in libraries today. But that was the exception that proved the rule. It was Tibet. It wasn't Han uh, China. So this um, strong toxicity for counterintelligence, uh, counterintelligence toxicity um, that uh, stops uh, the PRC from being a normal environment to infiltrate and, and spy um, has made it easier, uh, interestingly, for the PRC to recruit foreign spies themselves because people who go to China, study Chinese, who, people who are tourists, um, there's a baseline of surveillance, which we discuss in the book of interest to people who have to travel to China or do business there. Um, there's a baseline of surveillance that, uh, that everybody goes through, and indeed there are very clear triggers that lead to um, uh, focusing on an individual if there's any um, indication that they're somehow suspicious, like if they're working for what the Chinese call a mingan, a danwei, a uh, sensitive unit sensitive company that has technology, or if you're a Tibetan, or if you're a Uyghur. So it's easier to spot, assess, and recruit foreigners in China under these conditions. Um, and I wanted to uh, uh, do a footnote and point to the uh, two FBI videos people have made fun of, but actually they're very illustrative. Uh, the two FBI videos, which many of you may have already seen, are called Game of Pawns and Company Man. In Game of Pawns, we see a dramatized version of the Glenn Duffy Shriver case. In Company Man, we see a dramatized version of uh, some industrial espionage. And the, the difference between the two is that in Game of Pawns, the Glenn Duffy Shriver case, we're looking at a professional operation. In Company Man, the industrial espionage case, we're looking at a state-owned enterprise following an amateurish uh, uh, program to try to get some industrial secrets. Uh, uh, so with that, um, I'll, I'll say one more word about uh, uh, influence operations because that question always comes up. So there's always a, a mix up, by the way, in CCP history between the underground and the intelligence people. Um, by 1938-39, um, intelligence had become a core 
um, a core uh, uh, core um, operation, uh, core business of the party, along with propaganda, military work, uh, and uh, organizational work. And so in the uh, offices that the PRC, that the uh, CCP had in nationalist cities at the beginning of the, of the United Front period, which were like little embassies, there were people from each of those departments, including intelligence. Um, and the intelligence people then were often the ones who were called upon to pursue influence operations. Um, Red Star over China, which may, many of you may have read by Edgar Snow, is an example of an extremely successful influence operation. Um, and who was involved in that? Uh, nobody less than Song Ching Ling, Madam Sun Yat-sen, who was at that time not only trying to influence people to uh, see the benefits of the communist revolution, but she was also passing code books to local agents, and one of her chief contacts uh, indeed was, uh, um, was Dong Jian Wu, um, a, uh, an agent of the special services section. So with that, I'll conclude. And let's do some questions. Great. Well, um, I want to bring uh, Aruna into the conversation now and, and broaden this out a bit. I think I'll first just a, a couple follow-up questions based on, on um, Matt, what you and Peter have been talking about. P Peter, one of the things you'd mentioned is about bureaucratic politics or bureaucratic roles and, and behaviors. So I think my first question is broadly looking at Chinese intelligence as a system. Um, it's on, obviously operating under a political system controlled by a Marxist-Leninist party, which will give it particular characteristics. Can you talk a little bit about um, uh, what is it like to be uh, uh, an intelligence service operating under uh, the Communist Party of China? What, what's distinct about how its, its bureaucratic incentives are as opposed to intelligence services in, say, modern democratic systems? Well, I think there are two that I can speak to that, that come directly out of the research for this for this book. Um, the first would be, you know, for example, if you've read the news about what's been taking place in Hong Kong and the Chinese press statements about it, or the spokesperson for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, or the People's Daily, um, they've, they've painted all of the disturbances as coming from the black hand of the United States. And we often attribute this to some sort of paranoia, but it's actually kind of a logical outgrowth of the ideological system, right? The Chinese Communist Party says it has a unique grasp of historical trends, that its, that its theory, therefore, gives them unique policy insight to create, to craft policies that are scientifically adapted to the sort of the trends of the times, and that if something goes wrong, well then, it wasn't the theory, it wasn't the science, it wasn't the analysis, somebody must have done something. So that, that, cr that mentality creates a drive on the part of the intelligence services to essentially ask paranoid questions. And it's not, a, it's not as, it, where, this, where the, the difference is, is not a question of what is taking place, it's a, you know, where is the interference happening? Who is interfering and where are they doing it? And they're just searching for a piece of evidence that may or may not exist and they may or may not have the willingness to pass that up the chain to say, look, you know, we looked, we had good sources, and they tell us nothing, and they say nothing like this is taking place. Um, but because of, I think, of the ideological system, that's a very difficult thing to do. A second, a second piece of it that's, that's interesting is that when you look at, say, the Ministry of State Security, I am unaware in any of the organizational charts that I found, in any of the ones that I've tried to build up from interviews with, with people, there's nothing there that says there's an analytic department or an analytic bureau, right? The China Institutes of Contemporary International Relations are more closely, more closely resemble the open source enterprise than they do you know, the Directorate of Intelligence at, at CIA. And that in that absence of analysis, there's I, w I was told by, by a former intelligence officer from outside the United States that in his services view, analysis was done at the ministerial level or, or the vice minister's office, where someone who'd been in the service for a long time and was trusted 
and had sort of the personal um, protection of someone at, at least at the level of a vice minister, that that was where analysis could be done and, and put through the system. So what, this, what happens at sort of a more practical level is that you can see, and I think a couple of these cases are, dis are discussed in the book, you can see pitches to people who are, who are academics, who are journalists, um, who are sort of other kinds of investigators, and people ask, well, like, why would, you know, why would I get pitched or why would this take place? And the answer is, well, because you can talk to people, and therefore, when you write a report, if you write a report for the Ministry of State Security saying, this is my assessment of these things, the Ministry of State Security can pass it up and say, look, we're just the messenger. The analysis is from the source, not us. So don't blame us for, for what he says in order if the, or if the answer is wrong. I just want to follow up on that and read from um, page 21. Uh, the language Chinese intelligence uses reflects its Marxist, Leninist, and revolutionary heritage. The lexicon suggests and has been borne out in interviews with former officials who have had routine contacts with Chinese counterparts that the intelligence services are bastions of faith in the CCP. This may be a, a naive question, but is that, a, is that an asset or a liability, having, um, uh, having that level of, of firmness of belief in the, in the party and its ideology? Oh, both, right. I mean, the downside is, are the two, the two things that I talked about. The upside is that you don't get a lot of, you don't get a lot of defections, right? You know, Matt, a question for you is, um, as I was reading through the book over the weekend, um, the, the evolution of intelligence and the intelligence services uh, through the Mao period, but what I found interesting was through the reform and opening period. And can you talk a little bit, um, as China is opening out to the world and, and we see Deng Xiaoping is, is Times Man of the Year, Coca-Cola, blue jeans, the whole thing, um, what was happening in terms of uh, intelligence services? Was it becoming you know, more cuddly and friendlier uh, or, or is that a, a, a misnomer? Well, none other than Zhao Ziyang, seen today as a martyred hero of, of logic and so on, um, was the person who made the, uh, the speech um, advocating the founding of a Ministry of State Security and talking about all the enemies that were coming into China because of um, reform and opening. Um, Indeed, uh, if you step back a few years to 1973, when there was a, um, a party congress, I think it was the 10th, uh, that affirmed Mao's full control and affirmed the goals of the Cultural Revolution, um, everybody who was brought in for the car congress was brought in on, in underground uh, passages. And the reason that they did that seems to be that by that time, the Beijing Hotel was full of Americans and others. And they could look out and see people coming into the Great Hall of the People, and they wanted to keep that Congress uh, um, nice and secret. So as people began to, uh, as more foreigners began to come into China, I think uh, this was a turning point uh, that, that uh, then was followed, of course, in 1985 by the, the um, uh, defection of Yu um, Chang Shang, um, and, uh, which was a, a big problem course, uh, the, the first really big uh, trader from the Chinese side. And maybe just for time, I want to sort of bring us up to the, the very present now. And, and um, in the introduction to the book, you talked about this period in, in 2010 to 2012, where the United States found suddenly that its Chinese assets went dark. Um, and you, you, in the book, you said that that's because there'd been a compromise and upwards of 20 Chinese agents who were working for uh, the CIA were, were executed. You know, Runa, you've been covering this, uh, some of the cases that are now being uh, prosecuted here in the United States. And, and one I wanted to ask you about, because it may or may not tie directly into that, is the case of, of Jerry Lee, who was just sentenced to 19 years um, in prison just a few weeks ago. Right. So I wonder if you could talk about uh, that case, um, why it's important, and I wonder if you could hazard a guess as to the connection between uh, uh, Jerry Lee and this, um, this pretty disastrous intelligence failure uh, of 2010. So this is an important case um, of a longtime former CIA officer uh, charged um, and pled guilty to conspiring to provide 
uh, classified information to the Chinese government. Um, the connection to the deaths of these uh, sources for the CIA is not totally clear, but at his sentencing a, a few weeks ago, prosecutors made the case that he had uh, the names of eight sources written in his notebook that he had kept with him and had with him when he was at a hotel uh, in the United States when his room was searched. And, um, and they also made the case that he had gotten around $800,000 in cash that he had deposited uh, into his bank account in Hong Kong over the course of 60, 70 deposits. Um, he could not really explain uh, who gave them this money, why he got it, and so they were uh, alleged, prosecutors were alleging that he must have given the MSS information at least about these sources and um, other information to get that much money from them. Um, his attorneys were denying uh, that he did actually give them any information, and uh, so, what the connection is, is a little unclear. The, the attorneys were saying that um, the government never gave them a harm assessment, and to their knowledge, the sources that he had listed in his notebook were not actually harmed. Uh, we don't exactly know if that's true or not. Uh, the government said they don't perform harm assessments until after these kinds of cases are closed. So the actual connection to um, this pretty catastrophic uh, leak of, of sources for the CIA is, a little bit unclear, but um, uh, some officials are definitely drawing a, a link between the two. You know, the su sudden upsurge in, um, uh, I think, concern that you're seeing coming out of the U.S. government, and, and this, I think, is a question for everyone. And I'd also like, you know, Matt and Peter, if you have any thoughts on the this, this uh, 2010 uh, period. But is this because we're seeing an uptick in actions by the Chinese? We've got the cases of uh, Kevin Mallory. We've got... Um, Ron Hansen, We've got a number of these cases that are now being prosecuted. Is this an uptick or do we just know more now and, and are paying more attention uh, to activities by uh, Chinese uh, intelligence? And I'll, I'll start with you and if you have any, any thoughts. I, I think there um, seems to be definitely an uptick in the number of cases that they've brought lately and there seemed to be some concern that this was driven in part by um, China's uh, specific efforts to get a lot of information about um, uh, American government employees, like the OPM breach, get a lot of information, combine that with uh, credit card information that they get, um, financial information. They know who to target. All of the people you mentioned had financial problems and were specifically targeted with offers of cash. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's been a, a really big concern that uh, China has gotten better about figuring out uh, what the pressure points are mm -hmm. in the system and who might be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think they can draw a, a very clear distinction between the two. Mm. I, I would put it down to more aggression, more money, and more sophistication. And certainly the, it's, been, it's been a fairly significant part of Chinese intelligence practice, or if you, would use, if you chose to use the word doctrine, if you will, to build up sort of massive databases of people of potential interest. And this is actually the original, well, it's now the name used in the Ministry of State Security to, to describe United Front work and, it's, and the ministry's contribution to that, that issue of political mobilization and influence as social affairs. And social affairs work back in the 1930s meant basically mapping, mapping Chinese society for, for journalists, for academics, for in, other intellectuals who, who had a, a public who had a public platform, and how do you how do you find them and influence them? Who are who are the important donors in the, in the KMT? Who are the ones who keep things working? And f in dealing with the United States, for many years they never had this. You know, they were they were cut off. Then there was access. Then how do you you know how do you start mapping a society that you're not necessarily that familiar with? You can pick out the elite that you're coming in contact with but necessarily knowing what it is sort of at the lower levels um, is a much more difficult proposition. And you know, where before they sort of worked on, reti on retirees as sort of, a, as sort of a, a key focal point because they're not, they're not going through another security background check, they're not having to report their, their finances, they're not having to, to go through serious scrutiny. You know, this was a way that, that they could try to get that, under, that same understanding, but it's a slow process you know, and on Taiwan, they had, you know, essentially 70 years to do it. Um, and whereas for dealing with the United States, they didn't have that. And where, when you, 
when you take the compromises of, o of OPM, also Anthem Insurance, which is the company that holds the largest federal insurance, company, the United breach, you know, all of a sudden you're putting together a much, much different data set of people and activities, and you're able to map that onto who are, who are employees. And certain U.S. government agencies don't hold their personnel data inside OPM, so now you just have to map that against some of the other things that are available, and you can identify who they are and where they were. And once you have that kind of mapping, it's, it's a lot easier to, to go out and start chasing. Matt, you have any thoughts? Next, I, I think a question that is not only about um, not only about Chinese intelligence operations, but is this larger question of dealing with influence operations, and this is this tension that we seem to have between having an open society, um, but also protecting national security. And one of the threat vectors which has been identified by the U.S. government in particular has been Chinese students and Chinese scientists. Um, and so, Arun, I know you've been you've been working on this as well. I wanted to get your thoughts on. What is the, can you level set where the current state of debate is on the U.S. government in terms of how big the threat is? Um, what actions are being taken? And I think importantly, I'd like to, to get everyone's thoughts on this. Um, have we accurately calibrated the risk or, or are, we, are we spilling too far into uh, overreaction phase? I think on the FBI side, at least, um, the uh, concerns about talent programs and um, the efforts uh, at U.S. research universities are one of their biggest concerns. I mean, you saw them, you saw the FBI get up at a Senate hearing a couple weeks ago and basically say that they had been slow to understand this threat and they wish they had recognized uh, the scope of it sooner and you don't often see them come out and acknowledge any um, kind of missteps like that. And so I think that probably speaks to just how big a threat they do think it is. In terms of the current state of play, I think the past couple of years they've spent a lot of time going out to U.S. universities, trying to talk to them about um, these issues, and um, kind of not quite calibrating their message uh, correctly because they keep talking about concerns about theft, and then you have the universities ask them, well, show us what you're talking about. Uh, what what is this theft when uh, what we do here is essentially uh, for the public and um, given the nature of a lot of the stuff they're looking at they don't want to get into specifics they don't want to share classified information and so I think there you have a bit of um, talking past each other and I think you've seen the FBI um, try to recalibrate how they're talking about this and um, getting other US government agencies to kind of take the lead the funding agencies um, to be talking about it more as uh, conflicts of interest and um, concerns about research integrity um, and things like that. But I do think it is one of uh, the biggest concerns um, that even uh, FBI Director Ray ha has talk talked a lot about. You know, just following up on that, what, what solutions do you hear uh, FBI, U.S. government giving to universities to fix this problem? Are they essentially saying this is you just tighten up the ship or, or are they actually coming with practical solutions that, that universities can implement? I think as a baseline, they're at least asking them to have a full accounting of uh, the kind of research funding that all of their uh, professors um, and scientists are getting and um, to uh, be very upfront about what uh, funding they might be getting from these Chinese talent programs um, because a lot of it was not disclosed previously. So I think that's kind of a baseline that they're starting with and then uh, kind of escalating from there. Matt and Peter, you have any thoughts on this idea of, of scientists and students and how we might balance uh, protection with openness? Or if that's even the right trade-off to be thinking of? Hmm. Well, the <clears throat> infrastructure that's been set up by the Chinese side to bring people back is um, apparently very extensive. It includes um, helping people move their stuff back. Um, it includes um, uh, recruitment um, efforts for scholars who are in the middle of research. Of course, besides um, professional operations, there's probably a great deal of operations that are entrepreneurial in nature. And so um, when it's that way, then it looks a bit less suspicious. Um, but I think the key element that I hope is developed further is that when a government agency pays for research, um, 
that it's made clear to the researchers that they shouldn't be doing anything that runs against the contract. I'll just, I'll just say that from my perspective, we're, we're in a better place than we were 10 years ago in the way that the U.S. government is able to talk to outsiders about this. Um, the fact that so much of it is saying, well, trust us, this is in the classified realm, I don't think f sort of fits well because there's an awful lot of this information that's completely available from unclassified sources. And that is, um, you know, that that data is not being presented to explain in very concrete terms what's taking place, I think is a, is a very significant shortcoming. Um, because there aren't, you know, there simply aren't easy answers for how to say, how to handle visas, for example. You know, the U.S. government, you know, asks universities to say, take a look at what, at what the, at, at who's coming, and the university says, well, you gave them a visa, that's, you know, that's on you. But if you know how the visa process is done, um, you realize that, you know, thousands of these things get flagged as potential problems. Um, I think out of the, you know, something like 350,000 Chinese students that are in the United States, sometimes the, the sort of automatically flagged that should be followed up are measured, you know, in the 60 to 80,000 range, right? There's no human way to follow that up. It's being put on to people with full-time jobs to say, hey, can you take a look at a handful of these, right? And, and we do that because we have a pr presumption of acceptance. But if we're in this place where, you know, people throw up their hands and say, well, we're not even going to bother, then all of a sudden we're talking about a presumption of denial and just all of a sudden tens of thousands just go away. Some perhaps fairly, many probably not. And it's a blunt, you know, that, that kind of system for flagging things is a relatively blunt system. So if we're not able to find some medium in that, in that conversation, um, I don't think we're quite there yet. Because if we were, we'd be able to, the U.S. government would be able to talk in a much more open way at an unclassified level about the nature of the talent programs and what's, and what's taking place. Is this still an interagency process with a time limit where you can object or say nothing? I'm not entirely sure. I want to open up to questions. Or just one final one because the quote's uh, good and I want to see if it's actually true, uh, which is this. Um, we see this dichotomy brought up a lot as well in influence operations, this contrast between Russia and China. And, and a supposedly qualitatively different feel to, to the way Russia does things versus China. Th this quote, um, this Russia is the hurricane that comes in fast and hard. China is climate change, long, slow, pervasive. Um, I want to get thoughts. Not, you could ignore the Russia part of this if you don't have an answer to it, but on the China side, does that accurately describe what we're dealing with? And more importantly, is that the static way we should be thinking about this looking forward, or, or do we expect an evolution in how China is going to be uh, looking at the U.S., especially given we're entering this now much more volatile, fractious period, which is likely to be uh, a, a new uh, permanence uh, for a while. Anyone? So I've, I've been asked the question more than a few times over the, over the last couple of years about how to com sort of compare and contrast the U.S. or China and Russia. And on the intelligence front, you know, it's, I feel like the distinctions are, are small. You know, there's little bits, little differences on tradecraft, but when you look at, at the cases, you see all of the traditional motivations that are exploited. You see efforts to, to f coerce people into spying. You see people who are paid a lot of money into spying. And if you're doing that, you want results, right? You don't put $800,000 down because you think you're gonna get something someday, right? If you're putting that kind of money down, you think that you're getting value immediately. So that's not necessarily, you know, a 10, 20 year sort of vision of, of how we sort of cultivate someone and maybe, and maybe get something out of it. On the influence side, though, this issue of, of sort of political influence is that on the Russia side and in the Soviet days, the intelligence services played a much more important role. Um, they were sort of some of the main sort of executors of the policy. They played a crucial role in planning it. They had a lot of the capability to, to push ideas out there. On the Chinese side, I think you have to say that the Ministry of State Security or, or the military intelligence departments play a supporting role and that it's held at more senior levels within the party, um, you know, handled at the, at the Politburo level quite directly and, and at, from central government or central party departments. 
and not from the ministries. And you can see that the Ministry of State Security, like the Ministry of Culture, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Education, does contribute to this work, and, and they can play a critical role in it, in part because they've got capabilities that, say, the Ministry of Education wouldn't have. But they're not the leading role, and they're not the designer of the policy, and they're not necessarily pitching up ideas in the same way that you could see in the Russian context. The other point I'd make is that the only time the Chinese services ever acted like the KGB was 1942 to 44. And other than that, they've been under much more strict party control. Mm. They haven't been purging the party. Um, although lately, of course, MSS has been involved in some anti-corruption investigations. Mm. Mm. Parting thoughts, comments, criticisms, anything? Um, all right, well, why don't we go right into uh, Q&A. Um, uh, capital Q question. Um, Sir, right here in the in the third row, in right in the aisle here. Yeah. Mike, Mike's coming down your way. Hi, um, I'm Jim Mann. I wanted to come back to the se the late '70s, '80s period, um, and ask because that was a period when the United States and China were engaged in very specific intelligence cooperation: Afghanistan, Cambodia and in setting up a missile tracking system in some obscure province called Xinjiang. There was a lot of work done on that. And my question is, to what extent did the U.S. help? And, you know, and people like um, Bill Casey are making secret trips to China. To what extent did the United States help in the development of Chinese intelligence, either technically or in managing a new um, MSS? <laughs> well, I, I can only give a limited answer. Uh, certainly on the technical side, yes. Um, there was help from the US. Um, as far as humid goes, I'm not aware of any such help. Uh, indeed, I, I, I believe that uh, the two sides have always kept in touch, but I don't think the U.S. has ever trained the Chinese side like the Soviets did in the early days of the PRC. Alex, wait for the talking stick to come your way. Thanks, uh, Alex Bowie, U.S. China Commission. Uh, so, Peter, you said earlier in your remarks that China has uh, world-class intelligence capabilities. You also mentioned this in, I think, Chapter Six, especially uh, with the fusion of human and technical means. Um, could you explain a bit what you mean by world-class in this context? Is, does that mean parity with the U.S.? Does it mean something better that we can't do, or something else? I guess I would define world-class as as being able to, you know, one handle sensitive sources in sensitive government departments that you know, have to undergo a security checkup and might be subject to s some serious scrutiny, and to be able to do that in a, in a hostile environment. The second would be that their, that their proficiency is not limited to a specific sort of geographic place, but that, ha that there is a, that there is a, a sort of a, a global scope, maybe not everywhere all the time, but certainly on a able to operate in a variety of different contexts. And on the issue of, of mingling human and technical, it's, you know, I guess the way that I would put it is, think of the way that you would get to an air-gapped network, right? You need, you need to recruit a source who has access to that network and can carry a device across it and have it, you know, either deliver, deliver a sort of program themselves or to access that network and bring things out and be able to conceal that activity. And there were a couple of Taiwanese cases where they, where the Chinese intelligence services showed that they could do that. I'm David Crandall, retired from the Department of Energy and the National Nuclear Security Administration, where I worked on the science side of nuclear weapons part of the time. And I now work with 
some Chinese people, Chinese scientists who work on the nuclear weapons side, but do open science as well. What we work on exchange is only open science. It, my so, uh, security clearance information was stolen twice through OPM. <laughs> Uh, but it's clear that the people I've worked with have never seen it. So I'm interested in how do they use it, and uh, are they as compartmentalized as we are? The answer would be like we are, yes and no. Um, in part because I don't think we have a clear grasp of how, of how things get shared across, across the entire system. right? Everyone who's interacted with, with Chinese government interlocutors at some point has seen you know, a little bio across the table that's been prepared. So there's obviously some sharing of that kind of information and it, that it's accumulated across government, not just the intelligence services and is, is put in. Um, when you look at the sort of classics of Chinese negotiating behavior, there's discussions um, about how the Chinese side seems to be quite prepared in dealing on who they're dealing with and that they focus a lot on trying to identify sort of biographical details. You know, so we know something like that, information like that is conceivably shared across the system, but we don't know, you know, what that classification is or how they classify it, depending on what kinds of information that they have. And if they are talking about information about your clearance and what they stole, you know, is that something that's necessarily shared with everyone you come in contact with? Well, it sounds like not. But you know, you could bump into someone if you were meeting them in China, where you know it's a colleague who is, in fact, very well instructed on those things. There are a number of odd little things in the in the system where I think if you take a mature policy system like Taiwan Affairs or Hong Kong and Macau Affairs, it's likely that information is shared quite closely, in part because all of the different party departments and the intelligence services actually share cover organizations. Um, the United Front Work Department, the Ministry of State Security, um, the, the political warfare people in the PLA, military intelligence, they can actually all be in the same, in the same organization and using the same platforms for operations. So it would presume that, that you know, the fact that they might be sitting in some of the same spaces some of the time, that information would be shared more readily. You know, what that means in a less mature policy system where where the different agencies are not necessarily as well integrated, I think would be, would be anyone's guess. The other thing is that Chinese side has a history of denying everything. <laughs> I, I, I think that if somebody, one of your interlocutors was given any of that information, they were told, and don't hint that you know this. I'm Bethany Allen Abrahamian. I'm the China reporter at Axios. And I was hoping that you could talk a little bit about Wang Li Chiang, I believe that's his name, the perhaps defector in Australia right now. Um, is he who he says he is? All right. I think that one's on me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there are. I think a few things to keep in mind about what's been put out there in public about Wang Li Qiang. The first is that pe there are a number of arguments against him being genuine, saying, "Well, an intelligence officer wouldn't do these things and they wouldn't act like this." And you know, first and foremost, he's never actually claimed to be an intelligence officer. He claimed to be, you know, what in in at least sort of five eyes intelligence parlance for those people would be called a co-optee. You know, he's kind of a staff adjunct, if you will who's picked up by, by the intelligence officer themselves and integrated into what they were doing. So that's the, que that's the key part of his claim. You know, he's not someone, you know, what we know from other cases that are sort of out there in public of these, of these types of people is that they will be involved in operations, they will be close to the system, um, but they're not gonna know bureaucratic information because they're not connected by a through a professional linkages back to the services themselves. You know, what they have access to is basically what would be taking place around them. And so, you know, he, he could be opening envelopes to, to have read things. He could have been keeping an eye on, on sort of the comings and goings and, where, and, and also 
to be able to discuss what kinds of things he was personally involved in. Um, so that, I think, is an, is an important piece to understand about who, who he is and who he claims to be. The second is that some of the, th the questions that have been raised about him from, for example, the deputy director of military intelligence, former deputy director of military intelligence in, in Taiwan, you know, his argument was that because of single line handling in the intelligence services, this was an impossibility, you know, that, that, this, that Mr. Wong was connected in any way. And, you know, I think in the research for this book, it becomes very clear that Chinese intelligence operations are not operating along a single line, you know, where one person along the chain knows what's, what's there. That might have been something that was done in the revolutionary era. It might have been a feature of how Larry Wu Tai Chin was handled. It might be a feature of other sensitive cases. But we have a lot of other examples, uh, to mention the State Department OMS, Candace Claiborne, where it's clear that one of the people involved in the case worked for the Shanghai State Security Bureau, and the other one seems to have been a business person who provided kind of the, the services or you know, resources for that intelligence person to, to chip in. So it's, you can't say that, intel, that Chinese intelligence operations are just this clean, you know, professional, only handled by the service in this very, in this very narrow, specific way, um, that, this, that this part of his story does, does actually compare favorably to other, to other contexts. So the other, you know, the questions about whether or not he's reliable, you know, the Taiwanese things that he said are things that you could have said from reading off the press and, and having a very close read. We don't necessarily know what his claims are about Australia because as, a, as part of a court case that's been taking place in the last year or two years, the truth was ruled out as a defense for an Australian paper on a libel thing. So if you are the age, why would you, why would you put the specifics in there? And we don't necessarily know why there was a connection, um, you know, what, what the connection is with ASIO or ASIS. And a, and a quick final point is that if the person is knowledgeable about intelligence operations and intelligence services, you would know that if he went strictly to the Australian government, they would say, we'd like you to go back in and, you know, do this for a couple of years and then come out and we'll talk about you know, sort of taking care of you. Um, because it's much better to have someone running in place than it would be to have them sort of, you know, out of, out of operations altogether and only able to capture a certain moment in time. So if you were someone who, who is a part of this system, you know, connected ob obliquely as he was, why would you want to, and you want to get out, why would you try to keep it, why would you try to keep it quiet? Um, it's, not a, it's not a clean answer, but I think those are some of, the things to, some of the things to think about. You know, it's still, because we don't have access to everything that he said, we're not able to interview him, we don't necessarily have full visibility into the due diligence that either the Australian government performed or that the age performed in looking at him, um, I don't think they're I don't think they're babes in the woods, and I, there are a lot of people in Australia who, both inside government and outside government, who know how to do this work. So I think we have to sort of wait and see, but we can't just discount it on its face. Jeff Chen with the China Scope. Uh, we know the big unique part of this uh, espionage is they use uh, non-traditional actors, Chinese students and scholars. So I have uh, two questions. Okay, all right. Uh, do you think this has uh, to do with the uh, Chinese government uh, brainwashes Chinese people with the uh, so-called uh, patriotism? I myself grew up uh, singing the party is better than my mom, so serving the country is serving the uh, serving the country is uh, serving the party, and uh, loving the country is to hate America and uh, Taiwan. So I guess uh, this uh, influence uh, follows the Chinese students to this country, and uh, the majority of the students uh, get information from Chinese media. So I just wonder um, what your thoughts are uh, relating to, say, to this. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to that. We'll think about that. Why don't we, why don't we open it up to another, another question here while folks are thinking. Uh, right, th on the, right there, sorry, on the far, my left.
Hi, Mary. Um, quick question. Ministry of Public Security. So we've mentioned for the intelligence services, MSS and PLA. What about MPS? What role do they play in the intelligence service apparatus and what role will they play going forward? Well, after 1949, they were the primary counterespionage and counterintelligence service and the counterespionage elements of it were carved off in 1983 to, to join the Ministry of State Security. And until the, I mean, the Ministry of State Security did not become a national organization until the, probably the mid-1990s. And so there were an awful lot of public security people who had counterespionage type roles and then were eventually moved as, as departments changed. Um, so they've, had, they've always had a certain amount of their role. Um, I guess it's hard to figure out what the Ministry of State Security's access is to the, sort of the, the massive surveillance systems that are going up in, in China. Um, but a number of those are primarily done, owned by the, or sort of guided by the Ministry of Public Security. So it gets to that question of bureaucratic coordination and you know, how much do they share, how much do they get along. Um, and that might be something that, that changes based on the locality or in the relationship of individuals. But I don't think we, we know on its face. So if they, if they solely control those resources inside China, that means they have an, an incredibly important capability that, that will be crucial to counterintelligence and counterespionage. And so they would probably be taking a, a more significant role in it. They've also been involved outside of China. Um, it was the Ministry of Public Security that was, was in, in Burma and Laos. Um, trying to track down Nam Ka and the, per per the perpetrators of what was the 10-5 uh, incident uh, in, October, in October 2011, where 13 Chinese sailor, sort of river sailors were, were killed. Um, it, was the, it was the MPS, not the PLA, not the Ministry of State Security, that had its people sort of on the ground co contributing to the hunt. And for a number of the, sort of the anti-corruption investigations outside of China, uh, it's clear that the Ministry of Public Security has also been there. So we might be, you know, if there's a comparison to Russia, it might actually be, you know, similar to the SVR and the FSB, that yes, the FSB is internal and the SVR is external, but the FSB is, um, you know, moving around quite a bit. I don't think there's, a, and I don't think we can draw sometimes a clear distinction between what's a state security threat versus what's a public security threat, and therefore, you know, who actually, you know, who actually gets jurisdiction. I once worked on a case where <clears throat> an MPS officer demonstrated to me that he had knowledge of an MSS arrest of an American businessman by sitting behind his desk at his computer and just dialing it up. And when I asked him about that, he said, well, we're the ones who are responsible for uh, Guan Li for taking care of the foreigners in our district, so they have to keep us informed at a certain level. So that's just a single example, but indicates that they talk anyway. Uh, gentleman in the back, just in front of the computer. Uh, Dan Garrett, Secure and TNGF LLC. Um, Countries when they're in a moment of existential crisis always activate their national technical means and their intelligence services. What does the history of Chinese intelligence tell us about how China may surge its intelligence apparatus now to deal with this most existential crisis with the U.S.-China relation and also the situation in Hong Kong? Thank you. I don't, I don't think we have a good sense of how fast that, that takes place. Um, you know, one of the points you know, that, that Matt raised was, was noting that a strong counterintelligence served as the basis for foreign intelligence. And of the public examples that are out there, I think we only have two cases that are, that are public where the recruitment and the handling of a source was done completely outside China. Um, so that's not necessarily a good capacity to surge overseas if you're if you're trying to to address some of these issues. Um, what does that mean? 
I mean, I guess the way I would interpret that is that until there's a much larger sort of foreign intelligence capacity at, at a human level, that sort of collection in cyberspace is in computer network exploitation is going to be the primary means for trying to get out because that's the easiest way to to have a global capability and to reach out as, as quickly as possible. Uh, the historical case I can point to is the um, the uh, loss of the Kashmir Princess flight in um, 1955, I think, 55. Um, and during that time, uh, the whole PRC government, especially um, the intelligence services, were involved in, in an intense investigation in Hong Kong uh, that ended up showing that um, Taiwan was indeed behind it. I'm Alex Alper with Reuters. I just wanted to ask, I guess, more on the corporate side of things. There's been a lot uh, made about the national intelligence law, I think, from 2017, and how it could require, uh, the government could require companies to hand over data or spy on their behalf. And I just wondered um, if there's any clarity on how much it's been invoked or you know, what the government has really done with that particular law. Thank you. Well, the propaganda um, that has been reported on, for example, by the New York Times, uh, the cartoons, the, the videos, um, indicate that uh, one should never hold back any information from state security. And then you look at uh, every, every company that's, that's big enough has a party committee. Um, so the, the discipline that would naturally come with that indicates that uh, indeed people do what they're told and they cooperate. And I, I just find it conceptually impossible that anybody would try to push back. Now I've heard that, uh, that uh, I think Tencent supposedly pushed back, but quite frankly, I just don't believe it. I'll just say, when I had a, had a visit or a discussion with, with the, the China Institutes of Contemporary International Relations, they more or less- Can you explain who, who Kicker is for folks who well, may not know? They're one of the MSS bureaus, um, and they do, open, they do open source research and open source sort of interviews, um, you know, ostensibly for the purpose of analysis, and they also serve as an international relations training program for the rest of government and for the rest of the Ministry of State Security. And I asked, um, you know, we'd had, a, we'd had a discussion about U.S. intelligence reform five years before, and this time it was time to say, you know, now it's your turn to speak about China's intelligence law. And he said, you know, the, the thing that you need to understand about all of, this, all of this national security legislation is that it's basically putting into law what was already the rule, right? And making it clear that everyone understood that, you know, this was the way it worked implicitly before, it's going to work this way explicitly now. Which is also a great way to cut back on corruption because if it's in the law, it's easier to prosecute somebody. Sorry, uh, Adam Cozy with uh, CrowdStrike. Was very glad to see uh, SNITSEC or CNITSEC in the book. Um, yeah, Peter, you had mentioned uh, earlier that there was kind of um, a lack of an analytic bureau, or that Kicker was kind of the ones doing the analysis for them, which I think stands in quite contrast to what we think about with the U.S. intelligence community. Um, so my question is basically, who, in your mind, kind of comes up with some of the intelligence requirements? How? developed as the relationship between, say, state-owned enterprises and the MSS to kind of create those requirements that then trickle down to what they collect on, uh, since they don't have as robust an uh, analytic capability. Uh, 
Hi, Bob Sittinger. Um, congratulations, by the way, on this book. It's, uh, it's timely and it's, uh, it's overdue in some cases. But um, my question to you is you described this as a primer um, with the notion that there should be something else coming down the road that would expand upon this. And I wonder what you would consider to be the priority issues that should be addressed and who should address them. Uh, Mark Stuckert, uh, just retired from U.S. Government Commerce Department. Got your book about a week ago. It's phenomenal, uh, really very, very insightful. Uh, question, uh, the FBI has said that they've got investigations about Chinese espionage going in every single 50, one, uh, 50 of the states. Uh, that is a vast array of Chinese espionage, uh, which you detail very well in your, your book, Grains of Sand and, and many others. How many... Chinese spies would you estimate are working currently for the U.S. government that are embedded? More than 500, more than 1,000, more than 5,000? Just a, a range or a guess, a number. Thank you. This is how uh, the McCarthy uh, era started, by the way. <laughs> more this, than with you a can simple question. More than you can shake a stick at. Like, like SOEs who may be able to fill an analytical gap. What gaps do we have in, in the research moving forward uh, that will form the, the core of your second book on this? Uh, and then the last question, uh, how many spooks in, in this room? I guess I'd first, I'll take the, the last question since it's the easiest to respond to, which is I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna guess. Um, it's, this is the kind of thing that have to be, have to be quite careful of. And this is, you know, part of the point of the way that we structured this book was to, to start on the conservative side so that there's, you know, a hard center, if you will, that you can work out from. And, you know, there, there is a lot of, there are a lot of questions that I think come up about the informal system that's at work in the Chinese Communist Party, you know, is Matt pointed out there's a distinction between underground work and intelligence work. And underground work was much, much larger. And the people who were in under, the underground sections of the party versus the people who were back in Yan'an is one of the biggest splits in the party you know, from, from the 50s up until today. And you know, we should, this is one of those things where you have to remember that, remember that history so that it, it, there's a, there's a level in, of operations inside the party that's not necessarily trusted to the bureaucracies. And that's something that you know, helps answer the second question of you know, where, should we, where should we be looking and trying to explore. It's trying to take, okay, what do we know about the formal systems and how do we understand the informal pieces that come across it? As for the generation of requirements, the Ministry of State Security does have a requirements bureau. I mean, all of the open source sort of organizational charts analysis discussions with, with former officials or current officials in other governments have you know, sort of said, yes, there's something, there's something there for the central generation and, of reports and coalition and, and distribution of them. Um, but you can also see things in, say, the, the Jiangsu State Security Department case where you have an intelligence officer working for the Jiangsu State Security Department He's employing people to hack into GE Aviation, and he's working closely with Nanhang um, University to basically develop the requirements because that's the ultimate customer for the, for the material out of GE Aviation. So there, in this case, it seemed to be a direct connection that was generating it. Now, whether that was sort of formally sanctioned and he was said, you know, your job is to figure out how to help these guys, or whether it was a personal connection, you know, how that developed, I don't, you know, at least from what's available, it's anyone's, it's anyone's guess. So you know, there is something central, but there is something that seems to be kind of ad hoc and, and customer driven um, with respect to that. And I'll just make a final note on this issue of analysis, because Americans like to talk a lot about intelligence analysis in this sort of all source strategic assessment vein. And I hate to point it out, but that's a distinctly American invention. And most services didn't mimic that for a very, very long time. And to the extent that anyone did pick it up, they didn't pick it up on the same scale as the U.S. intelligence community. I want to bounce back to the question about um, Chinese abroad that was from the back of the room. Um, so 
I live in San Jose, California. The restaurant situation is vastly improved because of all the Chinese and Indian people who live there. I have Chinese friends, and the ones who are over 35 and who studied here um, and who were involved in Chinese student associations, um, they don't have the same um, experience that, more, that younger people do with the involvement of uh, Chinese officialdom in their business. Uh, and so that certainly seems to have changed. There's a, there's a much more focused effort, I think, to, to uh, harness the influence of Chinese people. And they don't have to be brainwashed because they've been raised in a, uh, I, m when I was based in Beijing, my daughter was in Chinese schools. And she heard all about the, uh, how the Americans were actually responsible for the opium that started the Opium War, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they already have a view of history which uh, is conducive to harnessing their influence. Um, and as for what we're doing in our next book, I just want to say I'm not imitating anybody here. Beijing, if you're listening, <laughs> we don't yet have from you a Chelsea Manning or an Edward Snowden. <laughs> we need that. We need those documents. <laughs> Ante up. Um, any, any final thoughts? Comments, conclusions, um, and uh, yeah, obviously to the poor MSS analyst who's awake right now at 4:30, having to watch this and write a memo. I'm sure he'll. That may be the Chelsea Manning. This may be the spark. Um, thank you, thank you, everyone, for up on the stage. Uh, thank you to all, all of you who came. Um, although not technically a, a, an exit tax, we are selling the book outside, uh, and so you can leave without purchasing it. Although we will make it difficult. Because um, uh, Peter will be downstairs at the lobby uh, looking at you expectantly. Uh, but we are selling the book. I do encourage you to, to buy it. Um, I don't know if we were able to hang around for a few minutes to, to uh, in, sign copies. Thanks again. Um, and, and hopefully we'll have them back uh, in 12 months when they've finished and published their, their next book. So thank you. Thank you.